keep it folded, right? But today, we actually know from, and that's for many studies across the last 20 years, that different cell types have, um, have different 3D genome uh, signatures, 3D genome folding, and that contributes to their gene expression programs. And that's basically what I want to talk about to you today. So the big, the big question uh, uh, that I'm interested in, how remote enhancers, and I'll talk about what those are in a minute, relay regulatory information to their target, to their target promoters is one of the central mysteries in genome organization of function, but you know, two of the leaders in the field, and Levan in, 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 uh, a review that's two two years old, and basically, so this this it goes into two questions that we can you can separate this into two questions interlinked questions. The first is how do enhancers find their target genes in the you know the vast space of the three D in nuclear space, and the second is as I said interlinked to it how are enhancers prevented from activating non-target genes. So how do they find them and how do they how do they not engage with non-target genes, which sometimes calls an enhancer adoption or enhancer hijacking, which can have, if it happens, can have severe consequences. So I'll talk about enhancer promoter context and gene expression control a bit. So you know that 98% or so of the, of the genome is uh, in, in, and I'm talking mostly about humans and, and mice here, is, uh, is non-coding. So it doesn't encode proteins and, for, uh, in the notion years back was that this was basically junk DNA. Today, that is kind of a debunked theory. And we know that within this vast space of the non-coding genome interspersed in this space are um, gene regulatory elements such as enhancers. And they drive, uh, they determine when during differentiation and uh, specific genes are on and off as depicted here. and they can be so a, a, a specific property about enhancers that both fascinating and makes them a bit hard to study is that they can be located at great distances from their target genes. And I'm showing this, this is a famous example of the sonic hedgehog limbert specific enhancer, which is depicted here in red. Can you, you can see my mouse, no? Yeah, it's depicted in red here. So it sits in, in the intron of an LMBO1 uh, of the LMBA1 gene, so an unrelated gene, but regulates none of the surrounding genes, but instead a gene that's almost a megabase away, uh, the sonic hedgehog gene, which is an important morphogene in many developmental processes. And it does so by engaging, by forming a direct contact um, between the enhancer and the promoter. And that's mediated by the 3D folding of the uh, chromosome, chromatin. So what happens if you experimentally delete this enhancer? It's a very uh, severe and specific phenotype in that it, uh, it uh, basically it leads to severely truncated limbs, almost absent limbs. And that's a remarkable phenotype because sonic hedgehog is required, sonic hedgehog expression is required in, required in many developmental processes, from brain development, gut development, Many, but in 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 those cases, sonic hedgehog expression by expression is driven by other regulatory elements, enhancers that are located in this in this space. Right, this one is the is the enhancer that specifically drives sonic hedgehog expression in the developing limb, and that's why this very specific phenotype uh, arises upon deletion of this enhancer. If you compare this to a sonic hedgehog genic knockout that will be embryonic lethal, just because the, the, the gene is required in so many developmental processes. But enhancers really have this cell type specificity. That's, an, that's a key feature. Uh, and remarkably, point mutations in this enhancer, so the, the same kind of uh, arrangement, the same genes and the same gene uh, regulatory uh, distances are preserved in humans and single point mutations in this enhancer uh, lead to malformations polydactyly in humans as well. So enhances as cell type specific gene regulatory elements, key regulators of cell fate, and they convey uh, regulatory information over sometimes over large genomic distances, you know, up to megabases, 
uh, through chromatin looping. I have an, another slide on, on Sonic Hedgehog here because it's, it's, it's such a fascinating example. Those are the same pictures you've seen on the previous slide. Interestingly, mutations in this set or uh, uh, also uh, one of uh, Hemingway's cat, Ernest Hemingway, the, the famous author, Hemingway's cats had mutations in this in this set or S, and the descendants still live in the in the Hemingway house in, in Key West, Florida, today, and uh, they have polydactyly. So it's 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 really a, a remarkably conserved mechanism. The next picture is, is, is probably from my favorite um, Sonic Hedgehog paper, and Evgeny Kwon and colleagues. And what they've done here is they've taken this ZRS. It's in, ZRS is the, is the other uh, name for the Sonic Hedgehog limpet specific enhancer. They've taken this ZRS and uh, replaced it with uh, orthologous sequences from other vertebrates, you know, human, fish. Um, I'm only showing a, a, a small selection of the data. I think 17 different vertebrates. And you can see that even when you replace it with the fish orthologue, or orthologue it can uh, recapitulate uh, sonic hedgehog expression and limb formation. But as soon as you go to limbless uh, uh, vertebrates, like python, snakes, uh, it's lost. So it's, a, it's, it's an amazing example where, you know, uh, um, even though the overall um, enhancer is, is relatively conserved, small changes in this enhancer uh, in, in evolution correlate with the loss of limb structures. So it's an amazing example. It's actually what they've done, what they've also done in this paper, I'm, I'm not showing this here, but I, I recommend you to read this. They've also done, they've, they've taken, so the, the Python ZRS has a 17 base pair deletion. Uh, that, that is the, the most marked difference to the, um, to the mouse and, and human sequences. And it's, it's a, uh, Binding, putative binding sequence for an ETS transcription factors. And when you put the, 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 the 17 base pairs back into the Python ZRS, you rescue this effect again. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful study. Anyway, so, um, so I've, I've shown you that these uh, extra links, so, so other, other point mutations and, and uh, or, or uh, Genome, genome rearrangements that, in, that involve enhancers lead to diseases. So um, the sonic hedgehog example we've discussed, and the the absence of the iris can be caused by mutation in PAC6 enhancer and Pierre Robin syndrome, which is kind of a, a, a deformation of the of the uh, face, with often associated with developmental uh, defects as well, like in, in brain development caused by mutation in SOX. Um, nine enhancer and as you can see in, in red in the brackets these occur over sometimes over large genomic distances i should say also that there are so while, while i'm what i'm speaking about here is the is the the mechanism that enhances uh, their mode of action that they uh, come into direct physical contact with the targeting promoters through chromatin folding i should say that there are also examples uh, in the literature, and this is this is actually a, a really nice study, I think, where um, there is no people have not deserve uh, observed a direct correlation between uh, enhancer promoter proximity and transcription. So, and for example, here this this in in this study, this is a live cell imaging study where they labeled uh, both the SOX uh, two enhancers, SCR is the SOX two enhancer, super enhancer the SOX2 uh, gene locus, and MS2 is a readout for the, you know, they, they've inserted MS2 repeats so they can monitor SOX2 transcription in real time. And what they find is that you have examples of, uh, you know, enhancer promoter contacts, for example, in this picture, that do not seem to result in transcriptional activation. So it's just um, something to watch that whenever, you know, uh, that, that it's, it's probably not one size fits all, but so keep keep these examples in mind. You know this is an an, an active area of of research, so there are cases uh, being observed where there is uh, direct enhancer promoter contact may not be required for transcriptional activation. But 
I think the, the general model is that for probably for the majority of cases, this is required. And the, the, the most beautiful demonstration of this, the, the paper that really convinced me to delve into this field is from the Global Lab published in, the, in, in, in Cell in, in 2012 now. And this is an experimental approach, which is called, which they termed forced chromatin looping. So where they forced the interaction in the beta globin locus, which is a, a very well studied locus for, for enhancers. Um, and the, the, the enhancer is called the locus control region, the LCR. What they've done is by you know, attracted, I mean, we don't need to go into detail, but basically they had zinc fingers that by the sequence uh, specifically bound the enhancer and the, and the gene and brought them together uh, by fusion to a, a gene LDB1. But it's actually not important what this, this fusion is. You can just the tethering seems to be important. And that results in the uh, activation of transcription by, by a factor of over a thousand fold. So it shows a really, whereas people have observed before a, uh, a relationship between these, these contacts and transcription. This one shows a, a real a causal relationship that you can, you know, by forcing these promoter enhancer interactions, you can actually induce transcription. That, may, that is probably not how it works in, in all loci, but it's, it's a really uh, strong and um, beautiful example. So I'm gonna spend uh, the next couple of minutes with methods to study uh, 3D genome organization. There's, there's two big branches if you want. One is uh, microscopy based and there's, uh, there is uh, amazing progress in that area over the last couple of years. It's, 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 it's not my, I, I admire this progress, but it's not my, my expertise. So what I'm, I'm gonna talk about is proximity ligation assays to capture chromosome conformation. And you can, you can group them in, in roughly like a different different families, so that they're all called the, the three C family from capturing chromosome conformation. So the, you will see them as three C and three C derived methods in the literature, and it's you you would employ different methods depending on the on the question that you have in mind. So for example, three C is when you have specific contacts that you want to study between an enhancer, your favorite enhancer, your favorite promoter. Let's say beta globin and the LCR, you want to, want to study that in different cell types. 4C is kind of an open-end assay where you, you, one, one position is, is fixed, let's say the beta globin gene, and you want to, to study all of its uh, interactions genome-wide, then you will get those. Uh, 5C, sorry, 5C is, looks at high resolution, uh, kind of uh, between, within a, different, within a defined, uh, 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 genomic region and high C, which is kind of the choice of method these day, is is and kind of all to all high C has the the, the ability to um, map all chromosomal contacts in a cell population. So I'm going to speak a bit about high C and its its, it's power and limitations. And they actually limit that they actually connected. It. it is is incredibly powerful, but in a way that's Crosslink, you have these neighboring uh, chromosome, uh, well, these uh, chromosome fragments in genomic regions in close spatial proximity. You crosslink them, you cut with a restriction enzyme, of course. You know, we, we now work with fully free sequenced genomes, so we, we know exactly where they cut. And um, then you fill the marks in with, with biotin, it's a, it's a standard molecular biology. A technique involving Klenov and biotin, one of the nucleotides that you offer Klenov is it carries a biotin moiety, and then you do the ligation. Mm -hmm. So what, what then you have created here is basically a fusion, a hybrid molecule between this uh, kind of blue and this orange piece of DNA that didn't exist, you know, never exists in, in nature, but can be used as a readout for spatial proximity. So it can be used the frequency at which you detect this, this, uh, this hybrid molecule is a readout for how often these regions were in, in, in close sp uh, spatial proximity. So incredibly powerful technique is established in, in 2009. The slight issue is that even when, you know, we're talking about the, the enormous power 
of next generation sequencing technologies these days. Actually, the, these libraries are so complex. If you start with millions of cell types, it's been estimated they contain, they contain 10 to the 11th unique pairwise interactions between 4KB fragments in the human and mouse genome. 4KB fragments is when you use a, a restriction enzyme in this, in this step um, that uh, has a six base pair recognition site, such as HINDI3. Um, HINDI3 is probably the most the BGL2, uh, but probably HINDI3 is the most widely used one. Um, if, if you actually use a, a four base pair cutter, so like DPN2, MBO1, it actually becomes even worse. So that library is even 100 times more complex. So, um, but it's, it, they're complex enough as it is with a six base pair cutter. And when you compare this to uh, when I sequence here in our facility, I might get 300 million reads or something like this, which is, of course, awesome. But it's actually that number is, is dwarfed by the by the by the complexity of these high C libraries. And that means, like, whenever you sequence them, um, you, you're basically looking at the tip of the iceberg. So you get what's 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 uh, what's what's frequent, but they actually don't look that reproducible. And sometimes people think that that is uh, that is because uh, high C is, is not reproducible. And I always try to argue with them that that's not the case. I mean, at least now, and when you with the, the current protocol and people who know how to do it, it is reproducible, highly reproducible. It's just the, the, the it's it's undersampling that makes it not seem reproducible. And you, there's of course an easy test. You do this. You take the same library and you sequence it twice on different days. And when you do that with a ChIP-seq library and RNA-seq library, you, of course, see that they're perfectly correlated. The high c library, much less so. so. That can't be explained by technical variability. That can only be explained by undersampling. So it's a huge, they're hugely complex libraries. So what we've, we've uh, tried to address this uh, hugely complex library, that, you know, what we were interested in for the reasons that I've gone through in the introduction is, is mainly enhance the promoter interactions. We wanted to know, you know, we wanted to get better insight into gene regulatory circuits and how enhances, which enhances are linked to which target genes, right? Because as I've shown you from the genomic, the linear genomic sequence, you can often make mistakes if you just base your, your, uh, your, your links on that. So what we've done is, is a technique that's basically adopted from exon capture. So we target with biotinylated RNA bits, we target the promoter fragments, and then we capture everything this, this promoter interacts with. You can see it a bit as a 4C, like an ex extremely multiplexed 4C, 22,000 4Cs in one experiment, kind of. And this is, you know, a, a, a real life screenshot. So when you look at high C, a library, this is around the cell one locus on mouse chromosome eight in, in the S cells, you know, and every arc here is, uh, represents a, uh, an interaction between two genomic regions. You can see that the high C libraries is, of course, hugely complex, as you expect. When you zoom in and only filter out the interactions that uh, are centered around the cell one promoter, is much less, and they will be much less reproducible for the reasons that I've explained in the previous slide. So when we use our technique, which we call it, this promoter capture high C, because we reduce this complexity of the library, we get a lot more of these interactions and they are highly reproducible. So in the next slide, this is of course just one, uh, one, one region in the genome. Next slide, I'm showing you that that's, you know, we get this enrichment across the, um, uh, the, you know, throughout the genome and to different cell types. So in blue, you can always see the, the, the reads that, you know, by default in the high C library map to promoters and it's, it's in, in, in human cells is always around 5%. Whereas in, in, uh, in, in, when we use promoter capture high C, this is um, by an average, you know, we get 15 fold higher and the theoretical maximum would be 20, you know, because five is the default. So we're quite happy with that and we, it, it works quite well. So one of the first things that we tested because, you know, our, we wanted to know what are these regions that we capture that interact with promoters? You know, what, what, home, what, what characteristics can we find? And as I told you, our aim was to find enhancers. So we, we looked for enhancer signatures first. And here what we've done, if we, we, we grouped 
the promoters by expression categories, so from lowly expressed, not expressed, to highly expressed, and then looked uh, within these within these uh, these bins for the uh, histone marks that decorate, uh, you know, the uh, corresponding the interacting fragments. So these promoter interacting fragments we call it. And to our relief, what we found is that um, the two canonical histone marks that people use to um, assign enhances, uh, H3K4 monomethylation and H3K27 acetylation, are uh, highly enriched in genomic regions that interact with highly expressed promoters. And they are depleted from the ones that interact with lowly expressed or not expressed promoters. That you know, is what we wanted to see. It fits. And uh, this is uh, really interesting. So our our method has has gained a lot of a lot of attention in the in the in the GWAS field. So uh, you know, G, GWAS studies, uh, genome wide association studies that link uh, disease variants uh, or that find disease variants that uh, that predispose you or can be predictive of disease uh, susceptibility or progression. And uh, a lot of those map to uh, DNAs one hypersensitive sites or close to hypersensitive sites. So they are in regions of open chromatin and show hallmarks of potential regulatory elements such as enhances. When you look at the genomic distribution, a lot of them, uh, so uh, a lot of them are in the non-coding uh, genome that found. And I think that that came as a surprise and people first started it, started this, they were expecting that all these GWAS hits would be in coding regions and you know they would directly affect um, protein coding sequences as such, you know, introduce stop codons or or change the change the amino acid composition of proteins. Um, and, and that is the case. So it's overrepresented. Uh, if you think of the genome-wide, this would be two percent, and and you know the the, the uh, the proportion that the D sequence have to genome-wide is, is 2%, is overrepresented. You find 5% of these GWAS hits in coding regions. Nevertheless, that leaves 95% of the genome with these other hits. So a huge a kind of untapped resource at the mo moment. And we, we and, and others are using promoter capture high C to link these, uh, these variants to causal disease genes, which is, you know, it's the variant to function. Um, challenge in the field. Okay, so I, I wanted to talk to you. So we first published this method um, five years ago now. So I wanted to talk you through a few uh, uh, key findings that we, we have from this. Uh, one, of, one of the first questions we were interested in is how do enhancer promoter uh, interactions change, or actually do they change? Um, during cell fate specification. So when you look at the, and there's, there's two, uh, two models that, that were out in the field, and uh, they're called uh, de novo or obstructive versus preformed or permissive. And so the, the, the different models predict that in the de novo acquisition of promoter capture, uh, uh, pro enhancer promoter interactions, you wouldn't find these interactions in a precursor cell, but you would find it in the, in the progeny. So they would form, you know, uh, concomitantly to uh, gene expression changes here. In preformed, in the preformed model, you would already find these uh, in the in the uh, precursor cells, and uh, they would still be present in the progeny, but they could carry different uh, histone marks, for example. So the, the the enhancer promoter contact may be there already, but the sequence that that is in contact here may not be an enhancer, but may only, only become an enhancer in the, in the uh, progeny cell state. So that, those are things we wanted to, to look at in differentiation and also in response to signaling cues. So what we find, and this, this is a, a, a screenshot, but I, but I think it illustrates general principles that, that we and, and, and others have found. We look generally at differentiation, and this is, this is an early neuronal differentiation from human ES cells into uh, neuroectoderm uh, precursor cells. What we, what we normally find here is that there is widespread enhanced promoter rewiring during cell fate specification, cell lineage specification. Not everything changes, you know, some are, some are there already, but new enhanced promoter contacts are formed, others are lost and some that are uh, maintained, uh, you know, the, the uh, 
activity status as uh, in 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 as far as you can use histone marks as um, as a as a readout for enhancer activity status changes um, that we also observe right so during differentiation we have kind of a mixed picture we see a mixture of 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 preformed and de novo so what happens in in uh, upon um, cell signaling in response to cell signaling and the uh, example we studied here was uh, hematopoietic stem cells in response to thrombopoietin, which is a megakaryocyte inducing uh, growth hormone. And actually when you do that, it's, 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 an, it's a nice system because within 30 minutes, you can see quite pronounced changes in gene expression, you know, nearly 2000 genes uh, change expression and about 10,000 regions change, uh, change in, in H3K27 acetylation status. So quite pronounced stages, uh, changes both on the, uh, the, the, the um, histone marks that are associated with enhances genome-wide and gene expression profiles. And you can see this as an example here, the spread one gene, you know, it's, it's much more highly expressed here uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the blue state, which is thrombopoietin, the yellow is, is the control. So after 30 minutes, it gets highly expressed. You can also see an increase in HCK27 acetylation at several regions, right? So what happens to um, promote enhancer contact in this region? And the, the answer is not much. I mean, this is almost like spot the difference example. There, there is maybe one here that changes, but overall, and that's consistent with, with other studies in, in the context of signaling clues, so really short-term responses that, uh, of cells that do not involve cell lineage, uh, cell fate changes, we we don't see that a massive uh, 3D rewiring of of the genome organization is involved. Okay. So it's clearly different here. Another observation that that we found, um, which which is um, kind of expected, but but it it leads to an interesting kind of theory behind that that we that we don't or different scenarios uh, that we don't fully understand. So I want to talk you through through this is that when, when we look at the number of enhancers that interact with uh, promoters, we find that uh, on, on, on the whole, the, the more enhancers a promoter interacts with, the more highly expressed the gene is. And as, as probably what, what you would have predicted, you know, you could just see if you, if you have this again, this, these are five categories that we had before. So you can see that if you have 10 or over 10 enhancers interacting with promoter, you can see that most genes are kind of uh, in the in the more highly expressed genes, whereas in, in for the non the, the genes that don't interact with enhancers, they are repressed or weakly expressed mainly. There are some that are highly expressed, so probably short range enhancers, or they might not require enhancer regulation. Um, so that's so. How how can we explain this? And and I don't know, but I want to talk you through. Through different scenarios, and this is uh, this is just a you know the kind of a, uh, a, 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 a simple and a, a mind game really. What I want to take you. So let's 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 assume in this simplistic model that an enhancer contacts its promoter fifty percent of the time, and that when it does, that leads to gene expression, right? So you have these scenarios here. You know, half the time. Uh, there is enhancer promoter contact, and that results in gene expression from the blue. Half the time, it's you know. They're not in contact, and that doesn't uh, uh, that doesn't then result in transcription activation. When you have three enhancers that interact with a target promoter, and each of them is individually in contact fifty percent of the time with its target promoter, that on the on the overall results in almost ninety percent of the time will there be one or more enhancer in contact with its target promoter. So you would have a situation 90% of the of the time you would have a situation that could uh, promote transcription right and that actually doesn't take into account so here in the further simplification is that i've drawn the same expression level here uh, for all scenarios irrespective of whether one or two or three enhancers contact the target gene okay? so that's something we we also don't know you know is it is there are there are there potential um, synergistic uh, or, or additive effects of, of enhanced activation that you know you get more transcription 
when more enhancers are in, in, in contact uh, at, at the same time with a target promoter. These, these are questions that, that uh, high C related approaches can't at the moment really study because that they're on this, you know, we study populations of cells. So this, this really requires single cell uh, approaches. But it's just interesting, interesting to see which of these, or maybe, maybe others, examples, uh, scenarios will, will, be, will be the case when we know more. Okay, so now I want to talk you to, uh, through, through a story about like very specific long range interactions in, in mouse um, yes cells. That's, um, that's a, uh, kind of one of my favorite stories and it brings, br brought me back to, uh, to in kind of a bit an unexpected way to Polycom, which is what, you know, Tarek was studying when, when, when he was in, in Renato's lab and, uh, you know, actually Renato Paro was the, was the first to clone the Polycom gene. So it was kind of a, a trip down memory lane for me. Because I actually didn't work on Polycom uh, in Renato's lab, but kind of through, through the back door, I, I got to work on Polycom. And I regret I didn't do it early. So what the, the question we started with uh, was to look at um, uh, just by using, using our promoter capture data and combining it with ChIP-seq data and just ask, uh, when, when we have two promoters that interact, so there are promoter-promoter interactions and there are promoter with the rest of the genome interactions and then that those involve promoter-enhancer interactions. We, we treat them separately, more for, for technical reasons that I um, don't uh, want to go into too much detail, but we can discuss if you want to. But anyway, we, we talk, we, so we looked at these promoter-promoter interactions and we asked, well, which proteins sit on there, you know, by integrating it with ChIP-seq? And what we found was that in mouse yes cells, the top hits that we got for this, for this class of, of proteins, out of the uh, three out of the top four were polycom group proteins. So that was, um, you know, that, that was immediately interesting to us. So uh, the one, the, the, the top hit here is ring one, is a, is a protein called ring one B, and that is the catalytic uh, subunit of the PSE1 complex. So, yes. PSC1 and PSC2 in mammalian cells, they, they come in and are different flavors. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, so, it's, a, it's slight over, so both PSC1, especially PSC1 has many different compositions, but they all share the catalytic subunit, uh, ring 1B, and that, um, that's the, the H2A K119 uh, ubiquitination. I think in flies it's 118, but it's a sim similar, um, similar protein composition and enzymatic activity. So and what we found when we looked at our data was we found this, this beautiful network of long range um, interactions, uh, long range on the same chromosome, but actually also between different chromosomes. And that's quite rare. So these could be called trans interactions centered around the four Hox clusters in, in the fly, you know, there's, there's two, um, two uh, the, the, the Hox genes are organized in two complexes. In, in uh, mammals, it's, it's four, and, but it involved, uh, so the, the Hox genes, which are known, you know, they're classical polycom targets, involved uh, 66 other genes, and a lot of them were uh, transcription factors, developmental transcription factors, so a lot of Hox gene, uh, homeobox transcription factors. So we had access to a cell line where we could deplete ring 1B, actually, Ring one B and ring one ring one A is also is con, uh, is is constitutively knocked out there, so there's no redundancy in the system. And you can you can see that you can see that here um, when we take this out in the knockout, ring one B is gone as you predict. But also the the modification that ring one B sets on chromatin H three H two A K one one nine implication is completely gone. So that's really a nice system to study this. And when we when we did this. Yeah, what we saw is that this network in the absence of, of, of ring 1B kind of falls completely apart. Um, uh, you can see there's only remnants of it, it left almost, uh, almost done. So almost completely dissolved in the absence of, of ring 1B. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, what happens to the, to the, to the target genes? To the, to the genes in this network, which we call the Hox network, Hox spatial network. Overall genome-wide, um, when you, ring, when you uh, delete ring 1B, 
uh, more genes are upregulated and downregulated, that's consistent with the notion that uh, PSC1 acts predominantly as a transcriptional repressor a complex. Um, interestingly, what we found, I don't have a, a final explanation for this, but it's an interesting observation. What we found is compared to all Ring1b, bound genes that are bound by ring 1b, which you can see here, is another representation of here. So they're mainly upregulated. You, know, you, you take a, tran a transcription repressor out, gene expression goes up of target genes. The, the genes in our network were, uh, were more upregulated compared to the to, uh, other ring 1b genes, quite, quite dramatically, dramatically uh, different. So it, it may suggest that in, in, in this spatial network, they're kept in a, in a kind of repressed but, but poised configuration, configuration that allows their rapid uh, transcription induction during differentiation. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens to the promoter-promoter interactions. The most surprising and, uh, uh, result for me was uh, when we looked at promoter enhancers. So, you know, these are promoter-promoter interactions, but each of the promoters brings their own enhancers with, to this network, right? So we looked at that separately. What happens to the enhancer interactions in this, in this network? And to my, to my great surprise, I, I predicted, you know, the, well, the promoter-promoter interactions fall apart, so will the promoter-enhancer interactions. They're not, they're actually maintained, but what they do is they change, and this is, this is now the, 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 so we looked at all these, these, these poised enhancers, we looked um, at the chromatin marks, and what you can see is upon this deletion of ring 1b, they, uh, they on, on, on quite dramatically lose the repressive mark, so they lose H3K27 trimethylation, but they gain uh, H3K27 acetylation. So what happens is, if we go from this kind of poised enhancer state, we, you take ring 1b out, and the the in, in the schematic, but, but that's, that's, that's what we see, uh, you know, the promoter enhancer interaction is maintained, it's that the enhancer changes its activity status from, you know, being, being having a repressive or kind of a post confirmation to an active confirmation. And that, that was a surprising result for me. Okay, and the kind of the last set of self data I want to talk you through is, and, and that's not, not mine, it's, it's, or ours, it's, it's from the literature, is uh, making loops and, and tats. So how are these, how is the, how is chromatin folded? How is the DNA folded? And the, maybe if you, if you followed the literature a bit, you will have, you will have heard about loop extrusion. That's the loop extrusion of how, how you make a loop and how you make a tat. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And basically what this model predicts, and that's been shown, has actually been now, last year, been shown also, um, that you can recapulate this in, 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 in vitro with, with the right components, is that you have these, these two key components, is a cohesin complex and, uh, and a CTC app. And cohesin is loaded on the chromatin, it's, it's kind of constantly loaded and unloaded on the chromatin by protein calls NIP, L, and WAPL. And, um, but if it sits on chromatin, the idea is that it extrudes loops, so it, it, the, the loop grows, and it's kind of dragged through there until it meets uh, in uh, CTCF size and conversion orientation, and then it stops, and that's what generates a loop, right? That sets uh, now a really established model. And that is thought to, to underlie the formation of TATs, which are called, top, so that stands for topologically associating domains. And they have, they've been uh, basically, you see this in, in high C heat maps, you see them as, as these triangles. Right? And the idea behind this was for a time that this, these triangles represent discrete units of, of gene expression that that um, uh, offer kind of spatial units where enhancer promoter contacts can occur. You know, if you think back of the, the two questions that we had in the beginning, but that also prevents specific enhancers from interacting with genes in, in, other, in these other domains. Right? So they, they, they uh, create these, these uh, they both facilitate you know, the right promoter enhancer contacts and they, uh, they impede 
kind of wrong pairing of, of the, you know, aberrant pairing of promoters and enhancers that may uh, then result in, in dysregulation, transcription dysregulation. Right? So a bit in, in a schematic, it would look like this, right? In the enhancer here, you can, you can activate gene within your own TAD, but not in another TAD. So, and there, there are really, there's a, a nice examples that, that really support this, this, this view. This is a, you know, a classic paper from Stefan Mundlos lab in Berlin uh, by Dario Lupianis and, and, and colleagues. And that showed that when you in, in, in the PAX3 locus, when you have a deletion, and that's actually, they found these deletions in patients and then uh, made mice that, that recapitulate this, these deletions, so because then they could study the mice, obviously. Um, if you have a, a deletion with, within this TAD, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't affect uh, PAX3 PAX, uh, expression. But if you have a, uh, a deletion that crosses a, a, a TAD boundary, takes away a TAD boundary, suddenly, you know, this enhancers here can interact, and that's, that's what you see here with a PAX3 uh, promoter and dried PAX3 expression in, in an area where it normally wouldn't, wouldn't be expressed, and that then leads to limb uh, malformations. So that the problem with this model was that, and, and, and so, it is drawn like this as if TADs are completely impenetrable, TAD boundaries are completely impenetrable. And that's actually, that was never supported by high C data. There's always a bit of a kind of an oversimplification. Doesn't mean they're not, they don't have a, a physiological role, but that's not true. But a, a, a greater problem for, for, for TADs to, as, as gene regulatory, you know, 3D units, Comes comes from the from the observation that what happens actually when you delete uh, uh, cohesin. So you can do this by by uh, this is the a Degron system, a plant Degron system, where you can really rapidly um, uh, deplete cohesin from uh, nuclei, and you can also uh, it's it's by by uh, auxin. So as a plant hormone, you can use and you know you have to have the right engineered cells, but uh, you can do that, and then you can you can study the effect of cohesion. Importantly, in the in the case of cohesion, you couldn't normally do this with a knockout because cohesion is required for progression through mitosis, so cells would just die. But in in this case, you can do it because it's reversible. But you can see here, so this is the wild type uh, situation where it's in a minus auxin uh, resembles the wild type, and these are tats, right? What you see here, these triangles, right? And what you if you then apply oxygen for six hours, so cohesin is completely gone, the TADs are absent. TADs and these, 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 these long loops are absent. But, and you, I think the, the, field, the field expected that they, this was, would result in pronounced gene expression changes. Because if, if they are, you know, these, these functional units of gene expression, then you would expect that that has pro profound effects. But it doesn't, you know, it's only very few genes are misregulated, and that's so. That's something. It's it's difficult to reconcile with with the effects that that we see that in the in the previous picture. It could be that TADs are more important during development. Obviously, this is done in in, in cell culture. That they are more important for uh, developmental gene expression changes, and that that's why you see sometimes these effects when you look at, um, you know limb formation or, or other examples, but that's still something that's kind of a bit of an open question in the field. Okay, and I want, I want to finish by uh, introducing you to the model for, you know, coming back to these, these two big questions that, that I outlined in the beginning, how do enhancers find their target genes in 3D nuclear space and how are they prevented from, from, from not finding the wrong ones? And so is the model that, that I want to propose is kind of a, a, a three, uh, kind of can be separated into, into three steps. And it's, uh, so, so the first one of this would be uh, selecting. You know, there are about a million enhancers in the, in the human genome. So in, and, but in every cell type, only a subset of these, maybe 40, 50,000 or so is active. So they first need to be defined, right? And that can be by pioneer transcription factors, transcription factors, chromatin modifying, enzymes, chromatin remodelers, all these kind of uh, um, 
a mechanism and that, and that defines um, you know uh, which which out of the large pool that is in theory available as as regulatory repertoire which which sub pool of those is active in a specific cell types then and as a second level of of um, of regulation I see uh, mechanisms that facilitate uh, these promoter enhancer contexts. They don't generate specificity in itself, but they increase the likelihood that these that these uh, contacts happen. And you know that can be relocation of, of genes to specific subcompartments. It can be TADS compartments as well that we've just discussed, and CDCF cohesion loops. You know they they would increase the likelihood that it, that these these kind of initial chance encounters happen and can then be stabilized, but they wouldn't directly mediate specificity. And the, the last step that as, as, as I see it, and what I see as consistent with the, the current um, states of the literature is that you would have specifying, so you would have selecting, facilitating, specifying. And that is, is then based on specific, uh, you know, within these, these compartments where these interactions are more likely. I still think there has to be another level of, of, uh, of specificity that is mediated by specific combinations of transcription factors, most likely, that are bound to gene regulatory elements and target gene promoters and interactions between those then stabilize what is initially maybe a chance encounter, encounters. So yes, that, I think that's my last slide now. So I want to um, leave you with kind of a, a, a thought provoking um, uh, slide in uh, my last slide that that comes from so it comes back to this forced chromatin looping that i that i introduced in my introductions to you um and this is a follow-up paper and it's the same first and same same last hour from same team as the initial forced chromatin looping but what they show here is that for example if you have as it is as is the case for the for beta globin genes so you have a gene family there and some genes um and they can they can be functionally redundant in development. Some are used earlier in development than later. You know, you have fetal hemoglobin, the adult hemoglobin, uh, and the erythroid. So what 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 they uh, propose as a model is if if we understand better and if we find ways to to actually engineer three D genome folding that if if you have this kind of situation where you have two redundant genes and an enhancer and normally in a wild type situation this enhancer would drive expression of this uh, gene that is has, has, has a muta mutation would lead to disease. Um, you could re-engineer this, this enhancer promoter contact to drive this enhancer away from this faulty gene to a correct copy of a gene that is redundant, can, can fulfill the same function, right? And then even though the mutation is not corrected, it's, 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 it's no longer, um, you know, uh, translate tra transcribed into 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 the RNA and therefore doesn't have uh, doesn't have the same effect and uh, disease causing um, consequences. So that's what they're proposing. Regulation of a gene can be overcome through manipulation of higher order chromatin structure. That such manipulations have potential for therapeutic applications. So that's not uh, in the practice yet, but to show you and and that it may well also have. Uh, direct therapeutic uh, implications of what we're studying, and yeah, so this this is what we've what we talked about: uh, complexity through gene expression um, regulation. Um, the, the, the level that I talked about is very upstream, as I said. The um, gene regulatory interactions at the in transcription and induction enhances in disease. I've listed a few examples methods to study genome organization. I focused on the 3C family um, of approaches. As I said, there is now really rapid and very impressive progress in microscopy as well. I've talked you to the preformed and de novo inter enhancer interactions, how we see different, different responses here during cell lineage specification and signaling um, uh, responses additive potentially synergistic effects of enhancer contacts on gene expression, loop extrusion with uh, TATS as 3D building blocks of gene control. If you read older reviews on this, they, they, there are some reviews that will uh, really put this, put this uh, 
forward pre-2017, um, just keep in mind that, uh, you know, the, the newer results, then this needs to be a, seen a bit more, um, a bit more critically these days, I think. And then I've, I've introduced a model for enhanced promoter context specificity. That's my view of it, but I think it's, it is consistent with, with the results in the field, at least as, as I see it. And the last slide was just the potential of en engineered 3D genome folding for therapeutic applications. And uh, yeah, that, that's my uh, acknowledgement slide. Uh, so the uh, promoter capture high C was developed uh, when I was a postdoc in Peter Fraser's lab in collaboration with uh, uh, Cameron Osborne and uh, Myra has helped a lot with this. This uh, is, is, is my lab now, Stephen and, and, and Young. Stephen's actually left. Uh, we, we only have, unfortunately, only have Young at the moment left. The, the computational, um, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, the, all these projects require really a lot of, a lot of bioinformatics input, computational analysis has been done by Nick Laskam, Bori and Felipe, mainly, uh, you know, Nick is now at the Crick Institute in London, and uh, my close collaborator for this, the, the current project that I'm working on, which is, which is supported by the UK Regenerative Medicine Platform, is, is um, the, the lab of my, my friend and collaborator, Ufuk and Östugan, especially Alexander and, and Julia. And uh, funding uh, for this comes from uh, the MRC and, uh, and the BBSRC in the UK. And yeah, I'll, I'll stop here and uh, thank you. Thanks for listening and um, I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you, Stefan. Very nice talk. So let's start questions, ladies and gentlemen. So you can raise hand and then we can. So I can on. probably start. Yeah, go ahead. So thank you, Dr. Schoenfelder. It was an excellent talk. Um, thank you. Have a question regarding the, uh, you know, the promoter, promoter interaction that you talked about. Uh, the ring 1B protein. So use the knockout cells uh, for that. So I, I was just wondering whether it's the catalytic activity or the, you know, kind of scaffolding uh, importance of that protein that is actually involved. Have you used a uh, kind of, you know, a kinase, oh, sorry, uh, E3 ubiquitin ligase inactive uh, mutant of ring 1B to find that out? Or? Yeah, very good question. Uh, we haven't, but Rob Klose in, in, in Oxford has, and, and he found that, uh, that the catalytic uh, activity is indeed required for these long range interactions. He hasn't looked specifically at the whole network. He hasn't done promoter capture IC, but he's done it on selected interactions with 4C and they are, they are markably reduced uh, when he, in, in, uh, in, in ES cells that have a catalytically dead version of ring 1B. So, so you do, do you expect, sorry, do you expect you will see different promoter, promoter interactions, ones that you lost? Due to absence of protein, if you had uh, different, if you had like uh, uh, activity, uh, mutant without activity. Ah, you think that a subset might depend on the catalytic yeah. activity and another, that, that's, that's another good question. That I actually don't know. We, we would need to, I think, if, if I'd known Rob was doing this, then, then you know, the, the, I would have loved to do this, uh, you know, to do the exact same experiment, the promoter capture high C on his cells, as he's 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 done it on a, on a subset of the of the interactions. So I, I can't answer this question. Um, it, it it would be an you know it's a relatively straightforward experiment to do. You're right. Okay. So another question is you know um, I'm not very familiar with uh, what you were talking about today, uh, but you know uh, are these uh, Enhancers present on most of the genes, or uh, selected genes, or yeah. So there, there are. Um, I mean, in in general, we find more promoter contacts for developmental for for developmentally regulated genes. Um, they seem to they seem to have a, a more complex uh, regulatory 
network um, that, that, that surrounds them and, and regulates them. Um, for housekeeping genes, we find fewer enhancer context. And I, I, I suppose that makes sense in a way, you know, because they, they, are, they just need to be always expressed in every cell type. So it, it's, it's, it, it makes sense to maybe have a, a less sophisticated uh, mechanism uh, for, for that guarantees their expression to something that guarantees more constitutive expression, maybe it's something that's a really short range enhancer or may even not require enhancer regulation. So I think enhancer regulation really becomes important for these, you know, sonic hedgehog is a prime example. Um, they're often located in, in, in quite gene den, uh, gene poor regions, sorry, and surrounded by, by, uh, by enhancers that then act in, the, in different developmental contexts. A context. Okay, last, last question is, you know, when we talk about specificity of the enhancer promoter complex, so same enhancer can bind to different genes. So, so are these proteins that bind to the enhancer and the promoter that, uh, you know, uh, confer the specificity or the sequence? Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's still, as, as some people look for the, for the factor X that, that you know, uh, that, that, that mediates all promoter enhancer uh, uh, interactions. I, I don't know, but, but my assumption is that that's too naive. I think it is specific, you know, there's, there's many different ways and specific um, combinations of, 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 um, of factors that are, that are bound to these, uh, to the respective enhancers and promoters that, that mediate this, these, these contacts. So it, it, it'll be different, it'll be different. We, we know there are some examples, of course, you know, LDB1 that was used in the, in the, in the forced chromatin looping is, is one that can mediate it. There are others that they, they can be homotypic, heterotypic interactions. I think we won't find this, this one fact. You always, every couple of months, there's this, 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 this factor that explains it all. And, you know, Yin Yang Wan was the last one. Um, and usually that turns out to be not the case. They, they, they turn out to, to mediate specific promoter inter enhancer interactions, but other promoter enhancer interactions are mediated by other factors. And I, and I think that that makes sense. And, you know, they, they can be both sequence specific. I mean, if it's a traditional transcription factor, you know, they, they have sequence specificity, of course, but it can also be um, the, 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 of course, the accessibility uh, to specific genomic regions for these transcription factors can be mediated by chromatin, can be, you know, impaired. Um, so the, these things all play into this. We know that if you look at, for, for a lot of transcription factors, if you look at, if, even if they have a clearly defined um, consensus site, we know that when you then look at the ChIP-seq data, only a fraction of these of these sites are actually bound in the genome, and that's because the chromatin is not always accessible. So, yes, sequence will play sequence will play a role in this, um, but also chromatin structure will. They're, they're kind of uh, both hand in hand. I ask this because you know the core components of the transcription uh, and gene regulation are the same. So one would presume that transcription factors they confer specificities, but then same transcription factor, for example, cyclin D, can bind to you know dozens of different promoters. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. So how does that work? Well, it's you know one one of the examples is that uh, as as I've said, so some interactions may be favored by these by these mechanisms that facilitate you know in closer proximity between these. And, and then there's, there is also a case that uh, often you have more than one enhancer. So they, it, 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 they, they could interact with different, in, in different uh, contexts, but. Sorry, uh, what I meant, sorry, what I meant to say was that, you know, different promote, uh, different transcription factors can bind to the same promoter. That's what I meant. Like cyclin D, promoter can be bound to yeah. 12 different uh, transcription factors. Of course, and, and you would think that they that they interact with different enhancers. Yes. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, that, that will be uh, partially at least facilitated. I mean, this, this is the, the second level in my model, the facilitating, right? That, you know, promoter 13, that's Bomber Seeker one, might, might see a, a specific enhancer very rarely, and it might see another enhancer very, very often. So it's just that it, it has a chance to interact with this one much more often. And then specificity could come from, from the, from the um, you know, the, the enhancers could have different protein complexes bound that, that interact. You, you, you say cycling D is bound there, but it's probably, you know, it's not just cycling D. It'll be other things will be bound at the promoter. Other proteins will be bound. And they may uh, facilitate or impede interactions with other protein complexes that are bound at enhancers. So it's, 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 not, it's not something we fully understand yet, but it's clear that uh, being in the same TAD alone uh, can't, can't uh, uh, explain the specificity that we see. And at the same time, being in different kinds, uh, TADs doesn't always exclude interactions. So that, that's Thank what you. I was trying to say. But which, which uh, specific, you know, the, the, we would really need technologies that, that are able uh, to, to map um, protein compositions at individual, at single copy loci in the genome. I think that's going to be a breakthrough if, if we can get that. that then we'll be able to, to, to um, address these questions. Because what we do now is, is um, you mentioned cycling D1, but you, know, you, you, can, you can take any factor you want. You do your chip seek uh, on, on those. You know where it's bound. You don't know what else is bound there. <laughs> Sorry, cycling D is not a transcription factor. I meant the Motor for cycling D was bound oh, by the different motor for cycling D. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So other questions. So let me ask a question, Stefan. Uh, yeah. So it means the role of tags is still, uh, you know, cons um, uh, is controversial. I would say if I I can use this word, it's yeah. not so clear. Yeah. So do you find or has someone found that you have cell type specific tags? So has people tried to trace, you know, the same locus and then try to see if it jumps in different tags? Then there, there's not. So the tags, at least when they were initially discovered, was that they are invariant across cell types. So they stay the same across cell types. And that, you know, then people started to define sub tags so you know, smaller you know, it's not always easy to see where a triangle is, where a sub triangle is in these in these pictures. So that sub tats change. Um, tats tats have also been proposed to be units of of, of replication. Um, um, you know, so there's uh, there's there's the there there are some there are these, and I showed the Mundlos example. There are some. Uh, really convincing examples that when you perturb tab boundaries that has profound developmental defects, developmental malformations. So, and, and that is, as you say, is, is not easy to reconcile with the fact that when we remove tabs, at least in cell culture, nothing much happens. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, still, it, it, it's still controversial, I think. I think at least in the beginning, the role of TADs as these, these kind of uh, mediators of uh, these discrete blocks of gene expression has been overstated. That would be my picture. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean they're not important, doesn't mean they're not important, especially in, you know, that they could be much more important for some genes than others. You know, some genes, some, some genes can, can tolerate quite dramatic, or well, for, for some genes, cells can tolerate quite dramatic uh, uh, gene expression differences if you don't regulate. Other ones, you know, haploinsufficient genes or so, is, is, is not so uh, well tolerated. So it, it could play into, into these things that um, they could confer more robustness to gene expression programs. But so it's, 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 an, it's, an, it's an open area. I think, I, I mean, I was, I was stunned when I saw this. And I think mo that caught most people by surprise. So when you, you know, the cohesion depletion results that not more genes were misregulated. I think that, that in general, that was a surprise for the field. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you say TEDs are 
um, suggested to be linked to DNA replication. So does that mean uh, regions of the genome which replicate uh, in the same phase of cells, uh, yes. S phase? Yeah, like uh, so replication A. domains, yeah. Uh, replication domains, I mean, yeah. So this is, um, this is uh, results from David Gilbert's lab in, in, in Florida. Yeah. yeah. So, so that, that seems to correlate. That doesn't mean they, that doesn't mean they, they don't have a, a function in gene expression, of course, but yeah. uh, they, they could have different functions. So could, could one suggest that uh, within that TAD, a single TAD, you have genes, I think this, this may have been uh, suggested, that you have co-regulated genes, genes which are, let's say, uh, transcribed uh, within certain cell type, it, it will be maybe a over ambitious suggestion. You, yes, it, it's not as 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 a statement as a general statement. That's not true. You you, you do see that, but you also find find tats where you know non-expressed and expressed genes coexist, and you know the the initial notion that that tats are are. Um, conserved between different cell types, for me, that's always kind of argued against the role in gene expression, because obviously we know gene expression changes between cell types. That's what makes them different. Right? Mm. So if the, if the, if the TATs don't change, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to reconcile that. So but then again, there are, there are these, you know, these, these examples. That's why I put this in the, from Stefan Mundler's lab. And there's, there's more examples. There's a, there's a, quite a lot were interfering with a TAD boundary does have effects. But that could be simply due to disturbing the three-dimensional structure of the chromatin. Yes, but that, I mean, that's, that's, yeah, yes, yes. A consequence rather than a direct cause. Yeah, yeah, I suppose, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so other questions? So we have a question from Najma Shaheen. Her mic is not working, so I'll read it out. So she says that what I get from the talk. Yeah, it's another question. So she says what I get from the talk is that the distance of enhancer and promoter is, is important for the gene regulation of transcription. For example, in Python ZRS, you mentioned that only a 17 base pair deletion leads to limbless phenotype. So is it the case that the genome within the enhancer promoter is also important for its regulation? Sorry, say the last say the last part again. So, is it important that the uh, is it the case that the genome within the enhancer and promoter is also important for its regulation? Y yes, I mean that in so in in this case the seventeen base pair deletion that I mentioned so that is a, a binding site for an uh, for an um, uh, ETS transcription factor. So it it would suggest then that that this factor um, is important. If, if you take away its binding site, you know it can, it can and the sonic cash expression is 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 no longer uh, maintained. That 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 factor is is uh, important for enhancer promoter communication and or transcription induction for and and its binding site is important for that um, transcription induction of sonic hedgehog. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure it does. Okay. So thank you. There's another question. She says that you mentioned that histone modifications H2A, uh, K119 ubiquitination, mono ubiquitination of enhancer is required for the transcription regulation of the target promoter. So is the transcriptional activation and depression irrespective of the promoter histone modification? No, sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to say that. I mean that that is uh, that is considered uh, and uh, that is consistent between um, mammals and Drosophila. That that is a repressive mark. There is a repressive mark. So, if if you take it if you take it away, if you take or if you take uh, ring one B away, then this mark disappears from enhancers and promoters. And in our case, we see this has profound effects on the promoter promoter network. But actually, on the interactions between promoter and enhancers, it doesn't it doesn't change much. It's just that the enhancers in this network then switch. From, from a repressed state to an active state. And most likely that is because this, 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 uh, this mark um, uh, is, is involved of, of in, in, in recruitment 
of the HVK27 trimethylation, which is, you know, is, is, is another polycom complex that's, that, that mediates that. That's the PRC2 um, activity. Yeah, thank you. Abdullah, are there other questions? Uh, not yet. So, uh, Stefan, uh, a follow-up question to what uh, Faisal already asked you about, you know, enhanced uh, promoter interactions. So, you showed there could be two models. One is de novo and the other is, you know, the, the permissive one, uh, the preformed one. Yeah, the permissive one. So, one wonders already, always uh, when we talk about these developmental genes, which change from cell one cell type to another cell type. Uh, so at what stage these permissive or de novo interactions may be taking place? Or let's say at the time of cell fate determination, uh, let's say you are, go you are still at naive stage when you still haven't committed to a specific cell fate, but now there is going to be this commitment to specific lineage and you need to switch on that A, B, C set of genes to commit to specific lineage. So how this interaction may be taking place? I mean, what is that switch? Uh, because it's a chicken and egg problem. You need to yeah. have either those proteins which bring enhancer and the promoters together or yeah. some enhancer <laughs> binding proteins or long range, long distance, uh, this looping proteins which you know bring a long distance enhancer next to gene. What are your thoughts on that? They're, they're, they're good questions. We, we, you know, it's, it's, it's still a young discipline. We, we don't know, we don't know many of these things with what we observe. And especially because we look at, you know, we start with hundreds of thousands of millions of cells. We, we really, what we observe is correlations, right? We observe correlations. We see specific interactions emerging or being lost and they correlate. We, the best we can do at the moment is to correlate them with gene expression changes. Right. So to, to find, um, and, and that, you know, that's, that's not, uh, that's, that's not a minor progress. We can look at these things genome wide now, so we can study them, which is great, but it doesn't really, the, the questions that, that you ask would resolve, would, would require a really fine temporal resolution of the, of these events. And ideally to follow that with, um, you know, with, with some live cell uh, imaging studies or something like that, to know that at what point is an enhancer promoter contact really first time required? Um, you know, is it, is it, does it have to be all the time there to drive gene expression? Does it have to be an initial contact? And then, you know, is there a transfer of proteins from the enhancer to the promoter? And then the interaction becomes less, less, uh, uh, important there are fascinating questions but truth is we, we don't know i like this idea of uh, you know permissive interactions uh, that they are preformed and maybe due to some signaling event you just switch on the uh, cell type specific genes or proteins the factors which then come on these permissive enhancer promoter uh, 3d confirmation and they switch on that that yeah. would be more energy efficient for cell. It it will it 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 will it would be. You're right, and and that happens. We see that. But if if it would if if there was nothing else, then the genome wouldn't be the you know the 3D genome confirmation wouldn't be different between cells. Then you could all do it from one genome confirmation, and you just switch on different parts of that genome. And that's not what we observe. We we observe we observe we observe clear differences, cell type specific differences. In, in these in this uh, genome organization, so there must be both. It must mm -hmm. be both rewiring and the, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, we, we sometimes say recoloring because it's it's in when you think of re of chromatin colors, right? The interaction is there, but the the enhancer goes from a poised state to an active state, and then that suddenly drives gene expression. But I think during during development, self fate specification both mechanisms coexist. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, there are other questions? Yes, so we have a question from Mahanur Hussain. Mahanur, you can ask. 
um, I wanted to ask, do cohesin and CTCF binding sites, they also vary from cell type to cell type? Yeah, it's, uh, that, that, that's a good question. Um, to, to some extent, yes. Uh, at CTCF sites, I can't give you, give you numbers. CCF sites, many CTCF sites are conserved uh, across okay. cell types, especially those that are at tab boundaries. Um, cohesin is kind of, I mean, most, most CCF sites are also bound by cohesin, but there is quite a large fraction of cohesin sites that are not bound by CTCF. And uh, those are more, uh, are more variable between cell types. The ones, the ones where they, they, they co-bind or um, uh, are, uh, there's quite a high overlap between, between cell types. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is, um, at one point, I think you mentioned that in some cases, direct enhancer promoter contact is not required. So is that only when promoter does not require enhancer for gene expression? Or there is some other explanation for, you know, long range interaction and bridging genomic distance without direct contact? Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. Again, it's something we, 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 we don't fully understand. The example that I've shown you what it was the SOX2, enhancer and that is an enhancer is clearly required for SOX2 expression right you, that's been shown you you delete it SOX2 expression goes down by 90 percent so um it, it it's not that this this enhancer is is, is not required for SOX2 expression that's established and, and that's that's accepted it's then about how does it do it does it does it require um direct uh, contact and in 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 um in high C experiments, you see very strong interactions between this this enhancer and the um, and the SOX2 promoter. So uh, that study was was a surprise, at all, but but I, I find these things interesting. You know, this, it's, you, you have to be open for for different models. So this study suggests that, um, uh, or well, let, let's put it this way: they didn't always see when they saw enhancer promoter contacts. They don't always see concomitant um, gene expression. Right? Could be because if I'm playing devil's advocate, because of course they've heavily modified this locus. You know, they've inserted LAC2 repressor binding sites, they've inserted MS2 repeats, all of that. But if if we assume that 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 didn't affect, affect kind of the natural regulation of the locus, then um, it, it doesn't rule out that contact is required, but it could be a contact that's more a transfer of, you know, it, it could be that there are specific proteins that sit on the enhancer that are required on the promoter to kickstart expression. And that those proteins are transferred from the enhancer to the promoter by a contact. And what they didn't see is, so they, they first, they didn't see in this study that um, when they, so they, it didn't always see a correlation between the, the, the you know, physical interaction by light microscopy of the two loci and transcription. They also didn't see like a characteristic uh, a, um, lack in this. You know, you could say if, if, if you, you don't see it directly correlating, but you always see it 30 seconds later or so. Uh, then that, that, would, that would give a hint to, to that there is a, 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 some kind of activity that uh, requires the contact, but then requires downstream processes that take 30 seconds and then transcription can kickstart. They didn't see that either. So that, that can't, it, it, it's still a possibility that the contact is required and then a stochastic other mechanism that, that is not kind of, so yeah, it would, be, it would have to be stochastic because otherwise they would have seen it in a, in a defined time interval. That's then, that, that then kickstarts uh, transcription. I mean, it's an interesting example. I just wanted to give you, uh, you know, different different examples and different also outline what's controversial in the field, and that's that's how science evolves, right? You 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 have predictions and you you learn, and it it's not about being right; it's about what the data tells you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, so uh, Dr. Jawad has a question. Dr. Jawad, you can ask. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you for your nice presentation. As I see, the most work they are done is in this field is uh, about the interaction between enhancer and promoter. So, uh, don't you think that the interaction between silencer and the promoter is also important in this case? I I absolutely think that, and it's 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 uh, it it puzzles me how that that that's uh, much less studied, actually than, than uh, promoter enhancer interactions. But it's something that I'm, I'd be really interested to study. I'm hoping I can get funding to study this. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think you're right. I think it's kind of, it, there's this, I don't know why there's so little in the literature about silences compared to enhancers. Conceptually, they should be equally important to me. Um, the reason is, I think maybe, maybe it's more a psychological reason than anything else. If we think of, if, 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 if we think of um, genes uh, or, or cells uh, changing fate, we think of which genes need to be switched on, or I, I tend to think that in a naive way, more than you know, which, which, cells need, which genes need to be switched off. But both are, of course, important. You can't have, you can't have one without the other. But it can also be possible that the gene is being signed due to the silencer, and removing the silencer actually activates the gene. Yeah. It can be like that. Uh, yeah, and there's, I mean, there's, there's a, a, a bit of a, um, there was, there was an, an interesting paper in, in Trisophila that identified mesoderm enhancers, I think, uh, sorry, mesoderm silences, I think it was last year, and actually shows that, um, that um, those silences that are identified, they act as enhancers in, in different developmental contexts. So it could be that, you know, we, we think of them as separate gene regulatory elements. It could be that at least in, in, in part, there are overlapping or maybe the identical sequences that act, uh, in, you know, in different development contexts, depending on which, which regulatory input they get, they function as enhancers and, and silences. And it makes me think a bit, but, you know, Tarek is, is, a, is, is the expert in that. It makes me think of polycomb response element and trithoric response elements, which, which are, you know, and also at least overlapping or sometimes identical. Yeah, yeah I was thinking, I was thinking of same thing, the PREs and TREs overlapping. Yeah. And uh, when people delete the PREs, they see the genes coming up uh, in the Hox, uh, in the biothorax complex, the Francois Koch lab did beautiful deletion uh, studies to show that, you know, these uh, PREs have uh, a repressive effect. Maybe one of the reason could be uh, fly people can do this. I know um, one has to do a, using some CRISPR kind of strategy to do this deletions of these um, random unbiased deletion of the genome, and yeah. then see which region has silencing effect. Enhancers yeah. are easy to characterize, maybe. But well, you say that you say that, but but even for enhancers, you know, we map them by by chromatin immunoprecipitation only. And that's not a functional readout. That is, you know, it's, it's, it's a mark. We don't actually know that, that all these regions that we then call, you know, you do a chip and you define your setup enhancers by P300 chip, HCK27 acid we, we don't know that all of these are enhancers. We don't know if there are other sequences that are, that are not marked by H3K27 acetylation that may also function as an enhancer. There, there is evidence that probably both is the case. We're both under and over represent and uh, 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 overestimating enhancers by these different measures. If you look at the as beautiful database, the, the, the Vista enhancer uh, database on in, you know in in mouse development, what they've done is they they took enhancer candidates, um, so strong P three hundred binding, H three K twenty seven acetylation binding, and cloned them in front of Lexi, which is, you know, at a minimal promoter classical enhancer test, and then integrate them back into the genome and looked when, uh, when reported gene expression is on classical enhancer activity readout. And in 60% of the cases that works in 40%, it doesn't. So, it, you know, that's, it, it could be because the enhancers are taking out of their natural context, at least in some cases, still it's a quite a high number, I think. Yeah, in fly, they have done this enhancer trap screens as well. So yeah. fly, fly enhancers uh, through this enhancer trap screens, they were much more reliable because you know they were not this due to chip and uh, 
chromatin in immunosuppressive patients yeah yeah jawad you have so a question asking, uh, what is uh, your experience about the constitutive gene how they are, whether there also there is a uh, promoter enhancer interaction or they are regulated without promoter enhancer uh, interaction Sorry, I missed the first part. I missed the first part. Because the, the gene which are regularly, uh, um, they are uh, constantly uh, expressed in the cell. Where they yes. are also so, similar, they are controlled by similar interaction, a promoter enhancer, or there, there, there is no enhancer promoter interaction in that case. We, we find much fewer, so for housekeeping genes, so, you know, constitutively expressed genes, we find much fewer enhancer contacts than for developmentally regulated genes. And um, I think uh, I, th I think that 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 does make some sense because you know you, you might just not require during evolution if something is is has to be constitutively on uh, mechanisms may have evolved that just mediate this across cell types that require you know less long range interactions that require more uh, rely more on short range interactions maybe not maybe it can be all driven from a promoter and doesn't require enhances. And that's what what we see in the data is pretty clear that the, you know, the, the genes that have that interact with multiple enhancers, you know, ten or more, they're all developmental genes. There's not no housekeeping gene in there. And so what about the what about the canonical? Okay, sir. No, no, go on, go on, go on. So what is your experience about it? Okay, whether the canonical and non canonical both uh, impact the uh, tears and the chromatin structure or whether still only the canonical pathway is impacted. So Sorry, you which, the, which canonical so pathway? Canonical PRC1 and non canonical PRC1. So both impact the uh, uh, chromatin interaction or whether only the can, canonical one in, impact this interaction. That's, uh, that's a good question. We haven't, we haven't looked at that. and and, and as, as you know, uh, the uh, uh, ring 1B is present in both, right? Well, this is, uh, so so, so when, when, you, when you knock, on, knock out ring 1B, or even as, as you, 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 your colleague suggested, the, uh, the, the, the catalytic subunit of ring 1B, you affect all PRC1 complexes. So, you know, they differ, they differ in subunit composition, but ring 1B is, is, is the central one that, that's always there. So it's a bit uh, a, a kind of a, a crude, uh, mechanism, uh, uh, no, a, a crude experiment, sorry, that, that we've done, it doesn't allow us to distinguish between uh, canonical and variant uh, PSC1 complexes. That's, that's absolutely correct. So I think we will stop here because uh, Stefan has a meeting at 4.30. I know we overran. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, for such a wonderful talk and giving us really a picture a totally unbiased picture. It was really a real treat to listen to you and uh, to learn all about the 3D uh, chromatin conformation within the nucleus and the way it is being explored. Many thanks. I wish you a wonderful day there. Uh, Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.